Hello, New York. Hello, SmartCon. Nice to, uh, nice to be here. I, I titled my talk today, which I'm going to try to fit into about 15 or 20 minutes, I titled it Proof Over Promises. And I, and I did that deliberately because I think we spent the last decade making promises and, uh, and claims, sometimes outrageous claims, faster settlement, tokenized assets, everything's going to be decentralized. A lot of that's becoming true. We see that in motion today. But I think the, the era of promises is over. It's time to stop promising things and start to deliver real value. And I think from here on, I think with, with uh, what we need to do is kind of prove things that need to be proven to be able to scale. And so proof of concepts aren't enough anymore. When we speak to our banks and we speak to our customers, you know, if you want a really terrible response, say, we're thinking about doing a proof of concept. Over. We've kind of proven what we need to do. The technical evaluations are done. And we really need to move from, from these proof of concepts to proof of safety, proof of compliance, proof of trust. Everything we do in finance, and I'm not going to use the term traditional finance. I'm not sure how we came up with that term other than we needed a, kind of a cool term for, um, for crypto Twitter. But it, it's all about trust. Everything we do in finance is about trust. So proof of, proof of promises means innovation in finance has to move to prove the value in production, not just promise it in theory or on a white paper or an outrageous claim on, on X or Reddit. It's really a call for accountability, for maturity, and moving from white papers and pilots to performance at institutional trust. And I want to put a, an important context in what we're talking about here today, because um, in a lot of these conversations that we're involved in, anywhere, online, in, the, in, in these type of forums, with client events, we all, have a re we all kind of migrate towards the retail implementation. And retail is super important, and there's lots of value that could be found there. All the buzz today, for example, in, in stable coins is primarily around retail applications. But institutions and the way that large value moves money, and especially cross-border and around the world, it's just different. If I instruct to move $50 of a private stablecoin to your wallet, that's pretty easy. It works pretty well. It's fast. You have lots of options. You have lots of choices. That's fantastic. We like choices. We like competition. We like the innovations. That's very different than instructing $50 million from the US to Singapore. Actually, it couldn't be more different. Right? So the comments that I'm going to make today are really around, um, around proof, but really more kind of geared towards an institutional context. So, so let's talk about what proof really means. And I wrote down some examples, because again, we're kind of beyond the theory and wouldn't this be nice and this is going to change the world and then no kind of color and content behind that. Um, so so let's talk about kind of different types of proof and how it might actually look as we go forward. And I'm not standing here today saying I have all the answers, I know how it's going to work, but let me give you some examples here. Um, proof of moving real value on public blockchains. It's not about demos, it's not about tokens, it's not about what I refer to as kind of onesies and twosies. Those are important, they need to be proven. But really what we're talking about, can you move real money, real money, and the value of that money on public blockchains? It looks like there's a path to that, we're not there yet, but we need the same certainty, the same auditability, the same compliance in place to be able to do that. That's how today's financial systems work. And, and, and I can tell you, in all the conversations I have in every place in the world, nobody's talking about changing how the financial system works. The question is, how do you use these new innovations? Some came through DeFi, some have come through other channels. How do you use those today to benefit and make things better for consumers, for businesses, and the way in which we move value around the world? Proof of identity in KYC. It was said earlier, you know, you have to know who you're dealing with. There's no such thing as being autonomous and in finance, every participant needs to be verified, whether that's an individual, whether that's a bank, whether that's a person who works for the bank, corporates, asset managers, even autonomous agents. We're not just going to turn the world over to, oh, the agents are taking over, so therefore we don't care who's instructing the payment or moving value. That's not happening, right? So even agents have to be verified. Who's responsible um, for them? And, and how do we verify identity um, using cryptology um, in these open systems to make them more trusted? Proof of reserves and proof of backing. Every token and asset has to have something that's verifiable. 
whether it's cash, it's collateral, it's a claim, um, it needs to be audited. You know, financial institutions need to do that. Regulators need that visibility and transparency. And they need to be able to do that in a way that, that um, is easy to um, validate that, that the things that we said were going to happen actually happened. Proof of compliance. Um, I, I believe that compliance can't live off chain anymore. It doesn't mean everything's going to go into all one singing and dancing blockchain, but money laundering, sanctions, the privacy of the data, these rules all have to be built into transaction logic. This is where you start to get real value. This is when you remove friction. You know, some people call it compliant programmability. One of the biggest promises we have with the new digital assets, whether they're stable coins or tokenized deposits or CBDCs, is the programmability of that, of that value. And then finally, the proof of governance and finality. And again, this is, this is, a, is, is a not a subtle difference between retail and institutional. Um, when something fails, there has to be recourse. There has to be a rule book. There has to be a way that we, that we harmonize jurisdictions so that it works properly. Again, $50 is not $50 million. If you're a corporate treasurer and you're sending $50 million to, to your supplier in Argentina, it has to work. It has to be de-risk, and you have to know what's going to happen when things go wrong. So, so those are kind of the, the different types of proofs I think are going to be evolving. So let's talk about some real-world examples here. Um, and we're seeing these proofs emerge across the ecosystem in every corner. I, I, I think in the last um, month, we've seen every major money provider, card network, and people who are stepping into this space um, announce deals, primarily around stable coins. So, so if you don't see the progress, you're, you're, you're not looking for it, or you're trying to hide, uh, because it's everywhere. L let me start with, with one, and I'll call this proof, of, uh, proof in progress, right? Because it just got announced. But Stripe and Paradigm are going to build Tempo. It's going to be a layer one blockchain. It's going to focus primarily on b to become a, a payments first blockchain that's, that's optimized for stable coins and microtransactions. It's not a promise. It's a live test. The, the Tempo is going to try to prove whether compliance and neutrality and governance can really hold up under transaction volumes. Th th this is fantastic, right? To move this proof of progress is going to actually show us that this is not theory, that we can do it at scale. And that's just one of a dozen announcements that have been made recently. Um, for, for, for Chainlink, for example, proof of, verifi ver excuse me, proof of verifiable trust beyond interoperability. And there's always a discussion about interoperability and how we connect systems together. We know. We've been doing that for 50 years at, at SWIFT. SWIFT started because domestic payment systems couldn't talk to each other cross-border. It's absolutely essential. You need to, it needs to be based on standards. It needs to have a rule book. It needs to be done in a trusted way that can be, that can be verified. So, so it's not that interoperability is not going to be important, but we're moving beyond that. We're moving into kind of important proofs about not only how the, the, how the tokens move on the networks, but you know, can we verify the truth that they actually happened? Do we have the audit trail for that? Um, Chainlink has been kind of quietly building that foundation for some time now. We've been actively working them, with them on a number of different things. I mean, you've seen announcements that, that have come out. But they've been building these foundations. I think they're important foundations. Um, I think about like CRE, for example. We're bringing verified real-world data and even regulatory proofs on change. This is how you're going to show how institutions can implement trust, um, not, not only for themselves, but, but, but for the world. And I, and I would argue, as you move to open public infrastructure, that openness and the right amount of transparency actually builds more trust in the system. And that's what we need. We need more trust in the system as we leverage these, as we leverage these, these innovations. Now, um, it's not just about interoperability anymore. We need to verify the integrity. Who are the participants? Um, did it work? Are there proof of reserves? All these things have to happen. And so um, it, is, it is happening. Um, it's not just about simple connectivity. And I think that you know, we see, also see Chainlink's role evolving all of this. And you're going to hear a lot more about that from Sergey's and, and the people in, in the lab. Um, but the next frontier is not just linking systems. It, you know, if we're going to do something autonomously, and you think about the intersection of programmable money um, with, with, with agents that could make up their mind and do things on somebody's behalf or on your behalf. It has to be, it has to be done safely. It has to be done in a way that compliance is provable. And again, you can do all of these things, but if you don't do those things right, you never get to scale. 
And you probably end up with maybe a worse situation, which is fragmentation. So we have all these different systems that don't talk to each other or just talk to each other on the perimeter, but really the fragmentation ends up impacting businesses and corporations and financial institutions and of course retail and consumer people. So we're going to move well beyond um, just simple connectivity. Chainlink's role is going to continue to evolve um, and that's going to be an important uh, aspect for, for the industry. Um, we're going to have to prove the things that we see today, whether they're stable coins, they're tokenized deposits, or CBDCs. All these things need to be proven in a number of different ways. We need to prove the data lineage that we have, you know, again, in an AI world. Where did that come from? How do we know that's valid? How do we know that's certified data? How is my agent making a decision with data that I, that I don't trust? Guess what? It's not going to happen. No, no, no responsible companies going to just hope for the best with the data that they have um, and, and, and start instructing payments or movement of value. No, nobody's going to do it. It's not pragmatic, it's not practical, and it's probably not going to happen. Um, another example we see now is tokenized deposits. And there's all kinds of buzz um, around the industry. A lot of the buzz, whether you're in DC or New York or other parts of the world, are really around stable coins. And I would, I would reference a, a report, and there's a couple of reports like this, but, but Citi a couple weeks ago published a report called Stablecoins 2030. And they made, a, made an estimate I think is pretty, pretty um, well accepted now. You know, even uh, Secretary Passant has made comments about the size of the stablecoin market going from roughly, call it $300 billion in stablecoins today to somewhere between two and four trillion, which is a substantial number, right? City in their report said the activity on tokenized deposits issued primarily by financial institutions and banks, um, and, and actually already happening, by the way, in Switzerland, in Hong Kong, in the US, um, uh, in Singapore. You know, th these things are already happening. Um, City said that the transaction volume in a year for tokenized deposits could be between 100 and $140 trillion. T, think of that number, 100 to $140 trillion by 2030, and we're staring 2026 right in the eye. Now, it's not about having an accurate prediction whether it's kind of moves faster or slower, um, but these are real numbers, and these are happening today. And this isn't about what's happening in the future. This is happening today, and the question is, how do you make that meaningful? And then how do you make that scale? Um, proof of orchestration. For some of you, you might have seen the announcement that we just recently made at Cybos about a month ago. Um, Swift's going to prove orchestration. Not in theory, not in hype, but the kind of coordination that our clients are asking for. We're, we're, we're a co-op. We're not a for-profit first company. We're, co we're driven by our customers and what our customers need. We provide solutions that help our customers provide solutions to their customers. Right? That's, that's what we do. And we've been doing that for, for a long time. So we made a deliberate, the, ver the first step, deliberate and very simple. 24 by 7 cross-border payments in the interbank market with tokenized deposits. Simple, the banks tell us they want it, they want to offer this service, they have demand from their clients. Is this the end point? No, it's the starting point, um, but it's the highest demand that we see. We need kind of continuous operations, we need the visibility, and we need compliance that actually scales. And that's what we intend to launch. And let me be really clear, it's not launched. And there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. We need to follow our formal approval process, our oversight, our governance. All those things are important to run at a way that, that people expect from SWIFT, and that's exactly what we intend to do. So we're, we're building carefully within the regulatory parameters in the full transparency of our supervisors, whether that's our board or the regulatory environment, um, and we're going to build it properly. And, 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 and once that foundation is proven, then, then the options become even more interesting. Right? Can, can we connect to multiple private and public blockchains? Um, that's an aspiration, but it's part of the longer term roadmap. It's not in today's scope. But I think everybody, in, in the way that you see the way these things are moving forward, um, that, that there's going to be a lot of demand, and, and we're going to respond in a responsible way to help move these forward um, in, in, in a way that's acceptable, um, not only in delivering the value, but acceptable to how finance runs today. So I would say that the really important thing here is it's not about speed. Speed matters, right? And speed's important. Um, it's about synchronized trust. We keep coming back to the same thing. It's about trust. If you can do something really fast, but you're going to run it off the edge, it, it's not going to work. 
And if it does work, it's not going to work for long. And, and you know what? The, 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 I guess one of the things I, I want to kind of leave you with as well is um, why a proof, why this matters. Let me give some proof of why this matters, right? And people, you know, that are in the, in the, in the DeFi world, you know, for some time, we, we've seen what happens when promises run ahead of proof, right? We, we, you, you can't prove reserves. You can't prove that it's operationally sound. You can't prove that it's compliant. We've seen what happens. You have collapsed bridges. You have lost funds. You, you have real people getting hurt. Right? Because, because you have re retail investors being left behind. No, nobody wants that. Nobody should aspire to that. Uh, and most people don't. And so, so it's not about speed. It's about synchronized trust. And it's about incorporating new digital assets and new settlement locations and doing that and integrating that into what we have today. And it doesn't mean what, what we have today is perfect. It's not. Uh, it, there's a lot of room for improvement. But l let me share one statistic with you that we published about a month ago going into Cybos. 75% of all payments on the SWIFT network, 75% reach the destination recipient bank within 10 minutes. Most of those within seconds. We're not doing any research to speed up moving something at the sound of, at the sound of light because that's not possible. 75%. Now, that tells me two things. One is, we're not done, and there's still improvements that need to be done. And we're actively working with our community and the banks to address the 25%, to address the friction that's out there. Because the 25% is not OK. So even though we talk a lot about tokenization and the future and where this is going, and I don't think anybody could be more excited about the Swift Ledger announcement than myself, but we have a day-to-day -day network to run that moves trillions of dollars every day that people rely on. We're, we're, this isn't either or. This is not a pivot to the future. This is us working on, one, removing the friction, and two, it tells me we have a last mile problem. We're connected with 150 currencies in over 200 countries. In some cases, we have a last mile problem, and we need to work with that ecosystem, with that jurisdiction, with those banks, with those financial institutions to address that, and we're fully committed to doing that. So it's really kind of a two-stage approach here. So, so, so let me leave you with a couple of thoughts here. Proof over promises is not a slogan. It's the new operating standard for finance. That's the new standard. Um, proof that value is moved so that every regulator can verify it, so every investor can be comfortable, so every risk manager inside of every financial institution can prove that the value moved exactly how we expect it to move. Proof of the participants. They're known, they're compliant, and most importantly, they're accountable. We need accountability for lots of things, not just in finance, especially in this country, we need accountability. That comes out. We need proof that assets are backed, they're governed, they work well, and that the outcomes are final. Again, $50 is not 50 million. Outcomes have to be final, disputes have to be dealt with. And that really is what's gonna separate infrastructure of the future with ideology. That's, that, that is the difference is that we're going to get to the point where when we have these proofs, we're going to be able to do it at scale, we're going to move beyond ideology, and we're going to build infrastructure that can be shared publicly and in a very positive way with, with, the, uh, with the world. And that's, to, in my view, what takes innovation and turns it into trust. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're all about. And we look forward to a really bright future. Thank you for having me today.